All right. Welcome to another episode of To the Fullest with Jason Froberg. Make sure you guys give us a like, subscribe, ring the bell, follow us on social media. And uh, today on the podcast, I'm very honored to have Swami Bharat Ananda, Linda Heller. How are you doing today, Linda? I'm doing great, Jason. I'm so delighted to be here. This is exciting. Oh, well, it's exciting for me to be back doing these shows again and it has been a little bit of a um a gap between my last ones so <laughs> bear with me as i knock the dust off of it but it's uh it's so great to have you here in my podcast and uh yeah you are a teacher an author i mean i got the notes so i don't mess it all up right we have and a personal language coach a certified conscious breath work and you're trained in uh cranial sacral therapy as well as Jin Shin Jitsu. Yep. You're also the author of two books and co-authoring a third one right I now am. with our friend Yvonne DeFleur. I'm so De excited. Yep. Well, tell me all about that. I no, mean, that is a, actually, that is that a part mouthful. Is a secret. That oh, part's a secret. Well, yeah. Um, the part about the co-authoring the book. That's yeah, going to be a, a surprise. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, the topic is a surprise. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, well, uh, let's just, let's start with you. How about that? Uh, how, how did you find yourself getting into Kriya <laughs> Yoga? It's always an interesting uh, journey that we have coming into this spiritual life. And uh, why don't you tell me about yours? So I suppose my journey is kind of like the child who says, no, no, I don't want to go. I don't want to go and puts their feet down, you know, and you're dragging them. So um, I suppose the first, my first adult years and my first part of my professional life, um, I was very much an analytical mind person. And um, it remained that way. And then, um, you know, life experiences happen and you begin to, life presents you with choices. And when you make the choice, when you say yes, you never know what's really on the other side of the door. You think you know, yeah, but you don't know. So, um, I... Um, was friends with a woman who was an occupational therapist. And she kept saying to me, oh, you really have to go take this class with Yvonne De La Fleur. I said, I don't want to. It doesn't interest me. She asked and asked for months, and I kept saying, no, I don't think so. It doesn't sound bad. And so then finally, I said yes. I had no idea what I was saying yes to. My friend just said, trust me. You'll really like this. So I said yes. And uh, that was a yes to what became 15 years of association with Yvonne de la Fleur. <laughs> and um, I became a certified transcendental rebirthing trainer. Wow. And I've worked with Yvonne for 15 years. And through that doorway, all these other doorways... Uh, were open, and I had opportunities to say yes or no. So um, my friend, the same one who was in the training with me with Yvonne, said, oh, there's a man coming who teaches conscious breath work. You ought to go. So I said, no, I don't think so. She said, trust me, you ought to go. So I go, and I met my teacher, and so I studied breath work with him for years, and... Um, I ended up going to India for six weeks, oh. and um, part of that time was spent in Rishikesh, and um, part of the time was spent in Haida Khan, the home of Babaji, and um, so we stayed there and bathed in the waters of the Ganges, and I sat and meditated in the cave that he meditated in, and um, during one of my trainings, it was kind of a surprise, but I was offered an initiation um, as a Swami, and so I said yes. So that's how I became Swami Bharadananda. And the name is, means the supporter of righteous bliss. Oh, that's beautiful. 
And so <clears throat> when I was speaking with Yvonne, she said, the name is not who you are. It is a name of becoming. It's an invitation for you to become that. But the choice about becoming that is mine. Yeah. So, hence later, you know, trips to India, more training. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, always, for me, um, satisfaction has been equated with service. Yeah. And um, in the 15 years of my association with Yvonne de la Flor and Transcendental Rebirthing, that is what it felt like to me. It was service. And um, when I teach, it's service. And even when I write books, it's a form of service. And... Um, I, I often think about, you know, it's, it's so easy for us to talk about things from our spiritual place, you know, of what we believe, yeah, kind of, and our thoughts about what is true and not true and right and not right. And um, I have experienced even more freedom and even more peace um, and transform my relationship with my own life experiences and my own life stories that I tell myself about my past. Because I don't know about you, but you know, the past is like a big knapsack you carry around or drag around if it's really big, you know, oh, it can yeah. be duffel bag size. And um, so I found that just meditating, just reading scriptures, just saying I'm spiritual did not take me to the place where I finally ended up. And that's, it's only a starting point of where I desire to go. Right. However, for me, my greatest teachers have shown up unexpectedly. Um, and sometimes it's like a moment in time. And something happens. Somebody says something. I see something. And all of a sudden, I have a new depth of compassion or understanding for myself and for those around me. Right, like your perspective just changes, and you can't change it back. Once you've seen right. something, you can't That's unsee. Right. You, you can't can, unknow. You can't unsee and unknow. Mm. And um, so, my, I would say probably the transformation. Uh, you know, it's like how do you how do you pick out those points of light that are the brightest. You know, everything contributes to who, who we are and who I am in this moment. Yeah. And good, bad, and indifferent. And um, so I'm so appreciative because my teachers have come in all different sizes and shapes. And some of them uh, carry the role of teacher. You know, I mean, that's their name. Yeah. They're a teacher. And uh, so... <clears throat> Others have been uh, a partner who said to me one day as I made my first ever camping trip by myself, and he said to me, you know, nothing you do for yourself is a waste of time. Absolutely. But for me, up until then, it had always been about doing it for somebody else, service for somebody else, and feeling guilty about putting my own desire first. So that was like one of those pearls of wisdom you tuck in your memory and you just keep going on. And then this same person, I'm walking down the street with him and we walk by a homeless person sit leaning up against the building, 
eyes kind of unfocused, reeking of alcohol, asking for money, and I feel uncomfortable. I'm on the inside, so I'm right next to him, so I'm walking down the street. So I avert my eyes slightly as we're walking by. My friend stops, turns around, walks over to the man, and starts talking to him. Absolutely. And he asks him how he is. He asks him what's working for the day, you know, whatever, and gives him some money. So as we resume walking down the street, and I said to him, why did you do that? When you know he'll use it to drink more. Yeah. And he said, can you imagine what it's like to have everyone walk by you and you're invisible? Yeah. And again, it was like allowing my heart to become more compassionate not by praying to be more compassionate, but by having someone ask me a question. Yeah. Can you imagine this? And I could imagine it. And all of a sudden, I could see all my years of, no, I don't want to look at the person, I feel uncomfortable, whatever. And it transformed me. In that moment, my life took on a slightly broader, richer, kinder, and, um, but I still had all my stories, you know, the, the childhood ones that always kind of interfere with all my, your present glowing experiences, you oh, know, yeah. and so you remember uh, something happens and they don't, you interpret it as they don't like you, somebody says no. Something goes on in your family, and you remember every past injustice and slight and whatever. <sighs> and it's like I got so tired of it, you know. And even when, with all my training, I, was, I could feel myself making progress. But I hadn't, I hadn't found the way to let go of the story. Yeah, that narrative that narrative of who the self is, yeah. right? And all the trauma and this like, uh, you know, but I suffered in such exactly. a way that you don't understand. My mother didn't love me. Yeah. She didn't pay attention to me. My daddy did this to me. My boyfriend did that to me. Yeah, we just and, carry that around like the sack of bricks our whole lives. And it's well, like, we do. And it's kind of like you have this lens of your heart and your mind with which you, you're seeing and experiencing the world. And those kinds of stories of lack, it's like they've taken and put a tint over everything. Absolutely. So the same experiences are happening to you, but you're feeling them through this lens of being unappreciated, being abused, being ignored, whatever. And so even though in the... I took these classes, I changed the way I thought, I changed my personal language, I could feel myself uh, being more positive and more engaged and more genuine. But the stories are still there, you know, and all it took was usually family members are the best for doing it or partners, you know, it's like, <laughs> it's like sticking, somebody poking you with a sharp stick. Anyway, so... By chance, I was surfing the net, and on Facebook, there was an ad for a TED Talk by Brother David Stendhal Rost, and I never even heard of him, but I liked the idea of the talk. It was on uh, gratitude and happiness. So I listened to him, and it was like 15 minutes, it wasn't too long, and it was it was literally transforming for me because he, he gave me, in his talk, he gave me a tool, a way to frame my life experiences differently and to frame my past stories differently. So instead of thinking about what my mother didn't do, <laughs> what my partner didn't do and what what I didn't look like and what I should have done. His The main thesis was happiness is dependent on external events. 
gratitude is something that you can apply to any life experience and it's an inner it's an inner th choice it's an inner state and so it's always there it's always yours and he said in any experience you can find something to be grateful for absolutely and so I thought to myself when I first listened to this talks cheap you know, well, what about this or what about that? And uh, um, the ego always comes oh, up with yeah, great defense absolutely. mechanisms. And mine is incredibly strong and very vocal. And so I thought, but he himself, his presence, created such a, uh, his field of energy, even through something like Facebook, was so powerful. I became intrigued, so then I watched him do something else. But I kept thinking about the gratitude piece. So, of course, life obliges you. And an, an experience comes up, and it's not pleasant. And I'm getting all set to be angry and judgmental and upset and thinking about what the person didn't do and how it didn't turn out. And I thought of what he said, and I thought, what in this experience can I be grateful for? And it doesn't have to be a big thing. Yeah. So I focused on one little thing. And it transformed my experience of the experience. So now, instead of being grousy about it, I was able to be calm and that kind of state of equanimity that one looks for, you know that evenness yeah the gratitude practice has changed my life entirely it was nice having like i have the mindfulness practice yeah. and i follow my breath yeah, and i'd love I to talk about <laughs> conscious breath work too like you're saying um i am not quite sure exactly what that is and i'd love to for you to sure. explain that more to me um but like when i incorporated the um the gratitude work you know, praying over every meal. It's like yeah. three times a day where I, I say three things I'm grateful for that day at that moment, ah. three times a day. And, um, and that just, it always brings me back right before you eat. It's just like, ah, you know, life's so good, right? I'm it so is. grateful to be here right now. I mean, look at all these great things I got going on. Even if it's a very stressful day or you're yes. in the middle of a very tedious thing that you have to accomplish. It's like, if you can just take that moment to say, Here's three things that are awesome. And, it, you know, you get that little flip in your consciousness. You can do it. I, as a matter of fact, I've never thought of doing it during the day like that, consciously just to name three things. Yeah. I, I always bring it more, for me, the way I've used it is, let's say, let's see, what was something that happened? Oh, I know. Recently, I took my car in for just an oil change, only to discover... <laughs> <laughs> that it needed multiple things. Of course. And so $1,800 later, I'm out the door with my car. And I could feel that thought of, oh, no, $1,800. And then I said to myself, I am so grateful I have $1,800 to keep my car safe. That's beautiful. And all of a sudden, the whole story was gone. Yeah. The story about how much the car was, the sniveling about all the money, you know. <laughs> and... um and you know it didn't collapse on you exactly on the side of the road they got it taken care of where it wasn't really a hassle it was right. money but it's like you didn't have to you know exactly. be abandoned for an hour and get a tow well, there's all kinds of great things Absolutely. we can be grateful for in these moments yeah and so for me um and i alluded to it when we were together yesterday um so for example um over the years, my daughter and I had lots of issues. She was my greatest teacher and showing me where I had not yet mastered the things that I desired to master. And um, so our experience was somewhat contentious. So one day last fall, um, we got into a disagreement and we were not too, I was snarky and she was too. So. <laughs> I normally don't like people don't like it when I feel people expect me to apologize. Yeah. I don't like that. So like a little child, I won't. You know, it's <laughs> like one of those things. It's not one of my more spiritually defined moments. Uh, I'm, I'm a Taurus, <clears throat> I know that I'm very bullheaded. Yes. So 
I thought about it and I reflected on it and I picked up the phone and I called her and she wasn't answering. So I left a message and I said, you know, I'm really sorry because I acknowledge I really played a part in that. And I'm sorry. And she called me back later that day and she said to me, your apology meant more to me than you will ever know because I had been so resistant. Yeah. So two days later, she was dead. Oh my God. That's so tragic. And so then, where do you find gratitude, you know, right? Yeah. And so, but I was able to find gratitude because she had been challenged by poor health and challenged in lots of different ways. And the, the continuum of her health was not going to be good. You know, the outcome was going to be very hard. Yeah. So I could be grateful that she, she had experienced happiness. I could be grateful that she died before her life became really a struggle. And I could be grateful that we had that moment. And um, so does that mean I'm not grieving? No. However, it helped me arrive at a point where um, I took a uh, seven-day course with Yvonne on the Heart Sutra. Yeah. We were chanting it every day. Yeah, I and, love the Heart um, Sutra. So we had to make a vow. That was the assignment. So for me, the vow that I made was that I was going to let go of those stories that we had referred to previously, those childhood, that big bag that yeah. I'm dragging around. And um, that I was going to let it go. And if I couldn't find a point of gratitude in the story to share, then I wasn't going to tell the story. Now, that's ironic because every day for a year and a half, and even invocation to mindfulness, is a series of stories. And they're stories about what life experiences individually taught me about different things, like some of them about um, having to do with language, the way we use words, and experiences that I had that were so powerful over the little words. And, uh, or they might have been, you know, sharings about... Um, about being grateful or stories. They're all stories, but they're not stories about what wasn't. Yeah. They're stories about how does life, how do life experiences, can they help you grow? How can they, how can they become positive no matter in the moment what you felt? There's a gift there if you can find it. In Yvonne's training, she calls it the golden nugget. <laughs> Which is kind of yeah. appropriate for Las Vegas. Sense. Right. And it's so true because it's like these are the moments that define us. All of our hardest yes. moments are the reasons we have the strength to do the things we can do today. That's it's correct. Because we went through this, this point in our lives where we had to push past what we had as a, what we thought was our limitations yes. into the unknown. And then we recognize our capabilities through that. And we, we grow and we become stronger. Hopefully. 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 You know, it, it, if you think about it, it's as if those, ex life is a series of experiences. It's like we were in school, like you were saying. Right. We've come to school. And so you can either look at the times you don't succeed as, oh, I failed. Or you can reframe it and say, I haven't mastered it yet. Oh, yeah. I always say, um, when I'm teaching people how to uh -huh. do um, specific skill sets, you know, I do th yeah. these complicated skills, um, it's fail forward. We fail forward. Yeah. Always um, look like I, anytime I have to um, figure out something new in life, which is a constant for me, I just mess it up right away. I guess I look forward to like, let's just screw this all up and then factory reset everything. Go, mm -hmm. we won't do all those things this time. That's and right. Screw it all up again. And then... 
all of a sudden there's a list of this worked, this didn't work, and exactly. we know what to do, what not to do, and let's try it again. And then like around the third, fourth time, we're like, oh, I see now, I got this. Yes. But if you fail and quit, you just don't get to that point. And it's no. like failure is always just a lesson learned. It's never... That's I right. never look at it as a negative thing. You can't. It, you'll never get it. But anywhere. most people do. Yeah. And even in school, when I coach teachers, instead of, I tell them instead of saying to children, that's wrong, say, well, you haven't mastered it yet. Let's try it again. Yeah. And what you're describing, that failing, people either look at it as, oh, it means I'm stupid. It means I can't do it. It means... But that isn't what it means. It's information. Failure is information. This doesn't work. Yeah. And that's okay. So, and that's okay. Yeah. So then the next question is, now what? <laughs> you know, so you come up with something else like you're describing. And you can, there comes a point where you decide, well, how many times do I try something new before I think maybe this isn't really what I want to do? But... Then you think to yourself, how many times is enough times? Mm -hmm. If you really are passionate about something. There is a number. There can't so, be. Yeah. Yeah. You just keep you just keep at it mm -hmm. and keep saying, Okay, now what? How can I do this differently? Yeah. Or maybe attempt something like um if you're learning an instrument, right? We don't try to learn how to play Eruption by Van Halen on day one, <laughs> right? It's just not how that's gonna, it's not gonna, that's yeah. not gonna work, right? It's gonna be very frustrating. So we try to take a big step back and do something a little bit more um, capable, you know? Learn a Green Day song, learn just three chords, and, and then we can move forward from there and learn maybe something a little more complex and a little more complex and a little more complex. Yes. And these experiences can stack on each other. And then a few years from now, you'll be playing Eruption, right? In essence, <clears throat> in learning, um, that's what they tell. And well, in the kind of learning that I ascribe to, they talk about instead of taking great big steps, you take smaller steps so that you experience less failure and more success because yeah. you're taking baby steps forward just like you don't expect a baby to stand up and run absolutely and you expect them to fall over but it's really kind of an interesting to, thing to think about about our relationship with failure i mean is failure even the right word we want to use and um it just depends on perspective, right? It's like I, I personally don't have neg negative connotations to failure right. because I always see it as a growing experience. Well, I've, you're seeing it as an opportunity. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Because that's what it really is. It's yes. when we put these, it, everything is perspective. Everything, you know, we we create our reality from our minds. And um, if you're putting all these negative connotations on all your experiences, they're going to be negative experiences because you're doing that. You're telling the universe this is a negative thing, and the universe says, yes, of course well, it is. And now you have a story. Yeah. It's to put in your bag, to drag <laughs> along. To drag around. You know? And it yeah. just keeps getting bigger and bigger. And mm. uh, it seems a shame that we're the authors of our own unhappiness. Yeah. Well, and, no, you know, and I, I think it's... It, it, boils down to like um, not a lot of people understand these concepts it's not taught to us when we're younger and nope. so we're kind of left on our own devices and like I know um, in my personal experience and most people I know you know their parents aren't great teachers at the this kind of like spiritual work and compassion and stuff they're just you know they're people that had a baby and they have whatever job or career path they're on and they're just doing their best to survive and keep food in your mouth and they're not really focused on these um spiritual awakening practices and and, and better practices so you're no. you're taught how to people by people who don't know how to people and um <laughs> yeah and so then it just continue it's a continuation until you finally accept the fact that you don't know what you're doing and maybe you should find somebody that um, can help you along the way and let go of all these things you're clinging to these concepts of um, how you were taught how to do things and um, how you were taught <laughs> what's right and wrong in the world and kind of let go and, and try new things and experiment and kind of, you know, 
fall into, I don't know, different forms of success. Um, one, of, one of the things, um, I took a class many years ago with Yvonne and a man named Matthew J. Peters, and it was called Voices of Power, and um, it was to get us used to social media, and I took it as a person who barely did email, you know, it was like, anyway. So my job was to become familiar with Facebook. So I did these series of posts for a year and a half called Mindful Mondays. Yeah, Mindful Mondays. Or invitations for mindfulness. So um, anyway, I'm making all these posts. I'm looking up. Real, you know how people get fond of the quotes and they send quotes and they stick them on Facebook? Yeah. So I did it for a while and then I thought... This is very unsatisfying. I don't like this. So then I asked myself, what does the quote, how does the quote, the philosophical quote, speak to me about my own life experience? So then I started writing these longer posts in which I, I shared an experience related to the post. And I found fabulous quotes everywhere. It was so much fun. I learned how to make slides. I was feeling very techno savvy, you know, until uh, I stepped in your studio. <laughs> and so, anyway. Um, it's a lot. It's a lot of uh, it's, it's a lot. electronics and it's, gear. And it's awesome. I love it. I live for it. Well, it's obvious, or it wouldn't look like this. Yeah. Yes. So, anyway, I came across this one quote, and I've. I've used it to help myself monitor my own thoughts and my own language, which was um, a quote about, does what you say and do and think go through the three gates? Have you ever heard that one? I've heard of the three gates. I haven't heard that quote before. Okay, so the quote is, in essence, it's a question. Does what you do... What you say or what you think, can it pass through the three gates? Is it kind? Is it necessary? And is it true? Yeah. And I find that if it, you want to get it through all three gates, you have very little to say is what I discovered about myself anyway. <laughs> and so, so true. it was a wonderful way to begin to reframe my conversations with people. And um, you know how you find yourself at a party or a gathering and someone always, there's always someone who has an opinion about what somebody else did. Always. Of course. And they want to share it with you, even though you're not asking. Yeah. So they'll tell you the thing and they're waiting for you to be complicit, you know. Yeah. Oh, that's terrible. And I thought, well, what do I say? And so the phrase that I came up with that worked so great was, that's not my experience. Oh, I like that. I didn't tell them they're wrong. I didn't tell them to be quiet. Yeah. Because they're entitled to whatever they want to think. Absolutely. But when you say it's not your experience, then what do they say? <laughs> Nothing. So it was so great. So nobody gossips to me anymore. Good. Uh, and even then, of course, I, just, is... I chose friends that don't gossip, Yeah. which makes it even better. But anyway. Yeah. The gossip is just, um, I think it's an, uh, just a knee-jerk reaction and almost like an instinctual thing we do. It's like, you know, we're trying to figure out where we fit in the pie and like trying to escalate our own hierarchy yes. subconsciously. And so we're putting other people down and say, you know, like, I'm better than that person. Like I'm better the than analogy that of like, you're drowning and you save yourself by standing on somebody else's shoulders. Yeah. So you make yourself feel better. Yeah. You're smarter, you're prettier. You're more important. And you do it at the expense of another. Yeah. And that's really sickness is what that is. That's that's an illness that you have right there. You know, it's yeah. just like the um the keeping up with the Joneses thing, you know. You're only you only feel satisfied and fulfilled as long as you have more than that's everybody right. else. But it's like when you look at the other perspective, that also means you're only satisfied and fulfilled if everybody else has less than you. Yes. Yeah. That's not that's that's not really um, a great way to experience reality. It's not very compassionate no. and either. And it's not sustainable for anybody mm. but you. Yeah, <laughs> right? 
<laughs> a, you know. Yeah, and you can get lost in that so easily. And then yeah. who are you comparing yourself to, right? Like everybody, there's always going to be someone who's stronger, someone who's smarter, someone who has more money than you, yes. someone who's more successful always. than you. And so if you're trying to play the game of comparing yourself to anybody than who you were yesterday, then you're going to fail. And you're always going to find that point where um, that doesn't work. It's not working. No, you know. it doesn't, and you're right. You know, it's a it's a constant process. It's like being a gardener of your own thoughts. Yeah. You know, and and making sure that no weeds are growing there. <laughs> Nothing invasive gets in there. Yeah. And um, it's on whatever level one chooses. I feel to move forward in life, whether one chooses actively to immerse themselves in a spiritual practice, um, or whether one is busy just working nine to five, you know, yeah. doesn't mean you can't apply the three gates to your thoughts. It doesn't mean you can't find gratitude in your life experiences. And it doesn't mean you can't quit telling stories. <laughs> you yeah. know, not, not all of us are meant to walk that isn't what we came here for. Not all of us are going to go down that road. Of, no. I meditated in Baba G's cave. I <laughs> walked the, the road in Spain, you know, the Christ road. We're not all meant to do that. No. But we can all be the best versions of ourselves. Yeah. And um, I've always uh, enjoyed creating programs for people who... Um, want to take pragmatic action to change the way they experience their life. And um, I think it's really possible. Of course it is. I mean, I help people on the daily now. Um, and it's through, like you were saying before, um, self-love, right? I, I work on myself and I put a lot of time into making myself be the best version of myself I can be. Mm -hmm. And I generate as much love as possible within my consciousness. And I try to emanate that out to the world. And when I go on to a job site or I'm around people that I love or just people in general, um, I try to give them as much love as I possibly can. And it ultimately leads to like, how are you doing this? Right? Yeah. Because I was there for most of my life. Um, you know, up until I was about 33, I was very materialistic, depressed, and caught up in this illusion, this materialistic illusion that's such a great trap. It's such a fantastic game it that we're is. playing. It's so convincing. And, um, and so as I peeled myself out of that, uh, that version of reality or that perspective of life, and I started to fix myself, you see everyone else around you still caught in it. And, um, and they see you not caught and they're like, what is it that you're doing that you can just walk around all stoked all day long like this? And I try to spread that love around to everybody and it really helps a lot of people and it's just little things and they don't have to, yes. uh, they don't have to come to the monastery with me and meditate and they don't have to read the books that I read or anything like that. It's like simple things like just teaching them, um, about spaciousness and, mm -hmm. you know, separating your awareness from your thoughts, recognizing that this thought doesn't define who I am, right? Because we're so caught in every single little thought. And it like, we, you know, for me personally, it was always like, I felt like that's what I have to offer the world. And this is the unique thing that defines me mm -hmm. as an individual in this game we're playing. And that sets me apart from everybody. And then you start to realize like, eh, everybody's kind of has the same thoughts. They're pretty cliched when you get down to it. And, uh, and so we can, we can create a little distance between our experience of those thoughts. And then there's like this openness that comes. And I just, that's, that's like one of the main things I try to impart to people. And it has nothing to do with religion. It has nothing to do with spirituality. It just, it's a game you can play with yourself where you can create that spaciousness within your, um, within your mind, clean up this mess up here and make <laughs> put you know put everything in yes. order on the walls and like move the couch and like oh now i can kind of hang out here and it doesn't suck so much i'm not so impacted right. by this non-stop barrage of mental regurgitation that the brain comes up with of all the things that's been put into it and it's just like hey look at all this stuff you you watched and ate and you know right. experienced and it's like you want to you know it's just going to blast you with it constantly and you're like 
you can do that over there. Yeah, gonna, no. You know, and I'll be here and those thoughts can be there. <laughs> and I won't allow them to define me, you know, and like try to alter my mood and, and that kind of well, thing. Well, and to be forgiving of yourself. Yeah, self-love. When you so do much. have the thoughts, you know. Yeah. It's just like um, we have a great... Um, one of the things you can tell yourself, you know, if you say, I'm never going to do that again. <laughs> and, of course, life always presents the opportunity, and you do it again. Of course. So then you feel guilty because now you're not a good person because you did the thing you said you'd never do. So <clears throat> I try not to have the word never in my thought process. Yeah, absolutism. And, um, so instead I substituted never for not today. I like that. I'm not going to say that today. I'm not going to do that today. Yeah. So maybe once in a while I screw up, but not today. <laughs> That's beautiful. You know, and then my friend says there's always such a thing as the best bad thought. The so best the bad best, thought. The best bad thought. So she says, for example, <laughs> if <clears throat> you were thinking about, well... Am I going to eat a whole pint of chocolate ice cream? Or maybe I could just go get a donut. <laughs> That's my best bad thought. Ah, go I get see. the donut. Like the lesser of two evils yes. kind of thing. She calls it her, her best bad thought. Right, because it's like when desire comes into your consciousness... You're attached to it regardless if you do it or not. Yes. You're still thinking about the thing and you're still attached to said desire. And it's like, right. well, get on with it, right? So I mean, either you can say, not today. Yeah. I, I know I want that donut, but not today. Yeah. And somehow, instead of seeing your life as a constant set of denials for all these little goodies we've been told are treats, yeah. you can just say, not today. And it makes saying no much easier. Yeah. Because it's a choice. Today, no. Yeah. Tomorrow, maybe yes, maybe no. It's very much like how we deal with addiction. You know, it's just one day at a time. Yes. I don't have to spend the rest of my life not drinking or not smoking or not doing the thing. I just got to get through t this one day. Yeah. And then tomorrow I'll have that to do. I'm not worried about tomorrow. Tomorrow's tomorrow's own problem. That's right. Today's, today's the thing I'm just going to deal with. And all you have control of is today. Yeah. As so, a matter of fact, all you have control of is the next breath. That's right. And it'll happen either way, right? And it's going to, you know, even if you're not thinking about it, that breath's going to come. That's why they and that is, I, you know, remember when you said earlier, well, Bob, what is that about conscious breathing? So, yes. So tell me, teach me. Oh, no, I don't know how much I can do that. So breath is the only thing. The only automatic system that we have that can be both automatic and conscious. Right. So we breathe and we don't think about breathing. Your body breathes for you. Or you can choose to consciously regulate the pattern of breath that you have. And <clears throat> patterns of breath can achieve different things. So if you want to relax, you might breathe in one pattern. If you want to energize yourself, you would breathe in a different pattern. If you wanted to, um, let's see, what else do they have? And I'm, well, they have breasts for everything. But so the, just taking those two examples. So if I wanted to relax, you know, you if you um, are following a discipline of yogi, then you would learn about yogi breath. So another way of thinking about it is what they call box breathing. So you consciously inhale for whatever count you want, and then you hold it for the same amount, then you exhale for the same amount, then you hold it, then you breathe again. Yeah, I like five seconds. It's like a okay, breath every so <laughs> three breaths a minute kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. So they, um, that's one way of doing it. So usually five to six breaths a minute is considered optimum. Any, like anywhere from four to six. Oh, yeah. And um, 
So, or you can breathe like when I'm walking or anything and I can feel my heart working harder or my lungs working harder, then you can change your breath and do three rapid breaths in and three rapid breaths out. <laughs> and when you do that, you'll get more strength and your breathing isn't labored and you can walk farther and longer. And it, it's bigger if you're walking, you know, yeah. and you need more. But, um, and you can, they use, breath can be used for relaxation, it can be used for energizing, it can be used to increase sexual awareness, it can be used for lots of different things. Yeah. And when it's done consciously, then it means it's done with intent and focus and mindfulness. And um, it can be a meditation all its own, just like yesterday. Yeah. And watching the breath come and go. So um, they teach in conscious breath work, they teach you breathing techniques till they become automatic. And so I remember when I was first studying, it was the hardest thing for me to figure out they were just saying, well, let the exhale go. Because when we breathe, it's... And we're controlling the exhale. But in conscious breathing, they want you to learn to not c control it, to just let it go like that. Yeah. So it's like teaching your body a whole different way of breathing. And I had the hardest time. I could not figure out how to do it. So one day in the breath class, the teacher said, okay... I want you to put your back to my chest. I want you to feel what I'm doing. And then when I could feel it, when his, I could feel what he was doing, then I could get my body to do it. And then it worked fine. So it was um, a real journey for me, the whole process. So I use it um, when I go to the doctor's office. I want to make sure my blood pressure is perfect. <laughs> I do, do conscious breathing before. <laughs> And the, no, it. yep. And my doctor always says you have the best blood pressure. <laughs> my doctor's like, him. are you like a, a cross country runner or something? Yeah, your no. heart rate is your resting heart rate is extremely low. And I was like, that's because I you, you took like fifteen minutes to get in here. I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I've been doing breath work. I'm so glad someone else does that. I thought yeah. I was the only one. No, I'm always like, let me see what I could get out of this. You yeah. Know? And uh, yeah, it's always fun to see the results. But that's, that's just a simple example. But breathwork is really much more, um, it can be used on lots of different levels, just real pragmatic ones, getting more strength, getting more stamina, getting more energy, lowering your blood pressure. <laughs> and then there is a, um, a state that you can get to with conscious breathing, which um, in which... I had done it for years, and I had never had the experience. They talk about rebirthing through conscious breathing. And when it was founded by Leonard Orr in the 70s, that's what he went for was this, the trauma of birth and to get you there through yeah. breath work. Never had it. Never could get it. But I liked all the other aspects of breath work, so I kept studying. So one day I'm in a training, like we went to a week-long camp and we're in training, and there's a whole group of us, and we're in, the, in this outside in this beautiful space, and we're breathing. And I finally had the experience of seeing my, the world through my eyes when I was a baby in a crib. It was the most extraordinary thing because in that moment, I, I'm looking at my parents, and I saw, I could see with my adult eyes through the baby's eyes, the pattern in my family that resulted in me developing stories about was what was and what was not. It was really uh, extraordinary. That's beautiful. I've only experienced that through ayahuasca. Uh, <laughs> I got no, I got and more I know hard work I have do. I have friends who yeah. um, are very devout and have a, a real practice yeah. with that and. Um, 
they're very uh, committed to it. Oh, yeah. It's wonderful. It's an amazing experience. Yeah. We've talked about it a lot on the show. But oh, I have talk you? About, we, I want to talk about breath work with you. Oh, okay. And one of the things that you said about um, letting go of the breath, it reminds me of a quote, and I can't remember who it was, but it's irrelevant, and the quote's all that matters. Um, and it has to do with the, um, the Four Noble Truths of Buddhism, right? Life is suffering. Suffering is caused by attachment. And to um, free ourselves from our suffering, we have to let go, right? Yep. And um, they use the example of the breath in that, right? It's like, we can't, you have to have oxygen to live, right? So you're like, but you can't hang on to it forever. You, know? <laughs> you have to let go, right? And so nirvana is, <sighs> and that is letting go. Yeah. But most people don't do that. Most yeah. people, it's... <sighs> yeah. So they, it's like letting it out through a balloon, you know, when you let the air out. Yeah. And so we're controlling the, the speed with which the air releases. But it's that letting go yeah. that done over and over and over again that actually like resets your whole body. Because... The breath has, and I know I'm, I didn't study this before I came, so I know I'm not going to do this quite the way I want. <laughs> Paraphrasing is perfectly fine on this but, podcast. But, you know, you have parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous systems. Yeah. One of them is automatic, and the other one is not. And so when you do conscious breathing, you reset the nervous system. And you can actually make a difference in the vagus nerve that controls your brain and goes all down through your body. And you can do that with the breath. So it's an extraordinary, um, you can control pain with conscious breathing. And so it offers lots of opportunities. And... Um, but I've used it primarily to lower blood pressure, get more stamina, and, um, and I use it for meditating, too, because it gives my mind something to do, to do the counting or the, yeah. the focus, uh, that my brain does not like being unemployed. <laughs> definitely so, does you know, it. you got to keep the that one, thing the busy. The thing about emptiness is form, and form is emptiness. I'm still working on it. <laughs> Can't so, have one without the other. But know. that is that is the thing. And what does that mean? Yeah. Form is emptiness, and emptiness is form. I'm still working on it too. You know, I, like, know. I have I have con I have like concepts of it, but it's yeah. not conceptual, right? And so it's like that already is the wrong move. Well, but you know, our brain is is our wonderful companion and tool and protector and. So we naturally mm. use it yeah. and go to it first to open the door. It's like the yin-yang, right? Um, where um, Alan Watts does a great speech on the yin-yang where, um, you know, it's the game of good and evil where white might imply that the good and black implies the evil and it's always going round and round. Is good going to win? Is bad going to win? You know, but it's like without the black part of the yin-yang, there is no white part of the yin yang and without the white part there is no black part the white implies the black and yes. the black implies the white and they, they require each other to exist together or they wouldn't exist at all and that's kind of yeah. one of the things for me where um form is emptiness and emptiness is form you know because without one or they have they both have to be or neither one of them is have you ever had the experience of um, emptiness, of vastness? Yeah, yeah. It was. Um, it was again during um, the beginning of my practice, where I was doing a lot of psychedelic therapy, and I um, recognized the emptiness not only of myself but in everything, and that this whole game we're playing is emptiness. And I was like what is the Sanskrit word for what I'm thinking right now? And I looked it up and it was shunyata, you know? And I, then like a year later, I'm like reading about the Buddha and the Buddha describes everything as shunyata. And it's like, oh, 
that's so wild that I, I like, um, you know, not on my own, but the, the, the plant medicine teaches us, you know, it teaches us through sources that we cannot comprehend. And, um, you know, it gave that to me in that moment and taught me, and I had that personal experience very much so where mm -hmm. I recognized that, like, I was like, oh, that it really is what I am within myself is this, em this is emptiness. Cause it's only love and compassion underneath it all. It's the, the, that homogeneous field of white light where the, it's nothing is, uh, separated from anything else. Right. But we have this illusion of separateness and then we start implying things to everything, but it's just this field of love. And, um, you know, we get attached to it and here I am attached Absolutely. to the field. And, well, uh, you know, we've got our dogs, we've got our partners, we've got our bodies, our bodies, our gardens, whatever it is, our car. <laughs> <laughs> it, there are, in this world, it is a world of form. Yeah. You know, and, and it's hard to conceive of emptiness because everything has form. Yeah. And so I suppose air would be the one thing you, you might think, well, there's no form because it's not defined, you know, yeah. with lines, but even but. it has form. Um, on a level we can't see. Oh yeah, and when you do see it, it's wild. I was um, I was doing a concert, um, this EDM concert downtown, and I'm sitting backstage, and they are just cranking the hazers, which is just like it's it's a fog machine, but it's like a little bit more of a mist. It's for lighting effects, mm -hmm. so you can see the beams of light. And so I'm lying on my back, um, <laughs> just watching the sky, uh -huh. and um, my consciousness kind of all of a sudden notices the haze floating up into the air. And it's not particularly a windy day uh, at this time. It was pretty calm. But as it drifts up above the stage and into the building, you start seeing the air doing its pattern and it's swirling uh -huh. and it's dancing and it's moving all around. And it's like, that's happening all the time, all or it's happening in this room right now. It's swirling and it's playing yes. a game and it's dancing and all these particles that we aren't, actually like um consciously experiencing it's still there that dance is still going on all around us at all times and um you know for some reason i had in my head that it was like oh well, if the wind isn't blowing then the air is just kind of static and maybe it's yeah, flowing no, in one would, direction yeah but it's doing this beautiful dance every which way and i just when i when i saw it for the first time it really changed my perspective on on like everything the emptiness and the space around us and how much I'm not perceiving all the time and mm -hmm. how little it's like, I feel like I'm peering through the tiniest pinhole in a blanket. And it's just like, I can kind of can can see, see what's it. going on on the other side, but I really have no idea. Yeah. I'm so blinded and I'm, I'm so limited with my, um, my five sense precepts and my, yeah. my ability to think. It's such a it's such a limited a, a way to experience this physical world we're in, and um, and to think that we know <laughs> is is so much hubris and arrogance, you know. Which is why I love the practice of don't know mind, which Sim yes. Master Ji Hang teaches, um, and I try to carry that with me all the time. And anytime I get in my own way, where I'm like, but I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I know, I it's know, like, I know. Ah! I know, I know that I know. And uh, yeah. my mind is the same. Yeah. And um, I'm very appreciative of it. And I recognize that sometimes it gets in, in its own way. Oh, yeah. Of understanding. And um, so <clears throat> in Transcendental Rebirthing, we have, um, part of it is a set of what they, we call sacred principles. And one of them is living in the question and I found that the best way for me to get my mind to relax and quit saying it knows <laughs> is to ask a question such as, what's the highest priority here? What's the most important thing to do? Mm. And then just wait. And sometimes, because I don't know. Yeah. And so I wait. And I have the most uh, wonderful experience of it's almost like a voice, like a little person on my shoulder or a voice inside my head. And it will literally whisper, 
the most important thing is. You know, and yeah. so I'll try it. Yeah. It's great. Def or I'll, what, what next? You know, what comes next? In that question that you're asking, yes. define here. Are you, are you talking about... Like oh, it can be here, anything. Here, here, like, like the yeah. general, like, like <laughs> lifelong here. Or are you talking about the moment that you're you're responsible for? You've walked into work and like, what's the most? Pro it can you can use it for anything. Okay. That's what I love about the question. Yeah, because sometimes it's kind of like you've got five people screaming at you. They want something to be done. Oh yeah. Five things. Okay, what's the most important? And you just do that one first. What's now what's the most important thing? And when I ask it that way, instead of making the effort to try and prioritize it myself, yeah. I find that it's much more effective. There's much less stress. So I use it both pragmatically and spiritually and emotionally. You know, like, okay, take a breath. What's the most important thing here? Yeah. And lots of times it's not the thing that we're all tied up in knots about. You know, that's the story. That's the baggage. Yeah, the narrative. The narrative. And so, I, and I love, when I say that, it, it's kind of a double thing because I love the power of stories to teach. And um, my book, Invocation to Mindfulness, is yeah. stories teaching stories, basically. And um, my posts were stories, usually based on something that happens. But those kinds of stories that where you take an experience in your life and you translate that into something of value, something of that teaches you about how to be E an even better version of yourself, you know, to keep mo learning, keep moving forward. That's much different than the stories we tell ourselves about what people didn't do for us, how they didn't take care of us, how they didn't love us, how they didn't help us, how they didn't, 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 didn't. Yep. And these are the reasons why I'm a victim. <laughs> yes. These are the reasons yes. why other people cause me to suffer. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Instead of recognizing that it's how we think about the experience that determines how we feel. It's not the experience. Yeah. Bad things, terrible things happen to everybody. We will all experience grief and loss in our life. I don't care how much money you got. Yeah. Everybody you know and love is going to disappear from your life. They're exactly. going to die. Yeah, everything you hold and cherish is and, going to disintegrate right in front of you. So now what? <laughs> yeah. You know, and so if we tell ourselves a story and it's about, oh, I'm abandoned, my child's gone, now there's nothing I have no, then that's the reality I'm going to keep. Or I can say, I'm so grateful for the time that she was there. She's taught me so much. I know that it's she's better off than she was. And I'm so grateful for my friends and family that helped me and supported me. So now it doesn't make the loss any less, but I have a different story. Yeah. And the same experience, different story. So I, to me, it's one of the things I wish for everyone, really, is that they create a new storybook for themselves. It's so important. And like while we're experiencing all these things, you know, we were discussing trauma out in the hall before we came in here. It's like while we're experiencing all these different moments in our lives, we don't have the capacity at that time to properly deal with them, right? When you're a Often, child yeah. and you're experiencing trauma, you're not built for that, right? And so, <laughs> no. and so you're going to hold that trauma physically and you're going to write this narrative um, in your head and hang on to it as, yeah. um, what, defi as what defines you, who you are, what you've been through, well, right? And when you weren't... You've got to explain it yeah, somehow. And, and you didn't have the tools to deal with it when right. you were so young and, and naive and, and like 
just you know new to this world and you grow up and uh, i mean I, you know you don't really know how to take care of yourself till you're like in your late 20s 30 i know like <laughs> I, I know like i when i was 21 i was like i'm an adult and it's like you're an idiot you have no <laughs> I, you look back as like i was a mess i had no idea what yeah. i was doing and i still was messing my life up constantly and it was until i um until i really accepted that fact that like all these all these stories and narratives that I was clinging to where um, my suffering was real and nobody can understand no like one knows what how I, I feel. went through. Yeah, you don't know how I feel. You don't know what I went through in my life. And it's like that is a cop out. It's like it's it's a most of our life experiences have been experienced so many times by so many people. They're practically cliches at this point. And, um, but we, we only get this one set of eyes to look through and experience the world once. And so it doesn't feel that way to us. Right. right. It's very personal. Yeah. It's so personal. But when we take the time to reflect on things and rewrite these stories as an adult, like, um, you know, if you go back and, and relive that trauma as an adult and with forgiveness in your heart, and compassion in your heart, and you can see the perspective of the other person or the other, whatever it is that's mm-hmm. occurring to you that you're clinging to that's, um, that's created this, this wall or this bag of bricks that you're dragging behind you and, and just let go of that and, and recognize that that person didn't know what they were doing. You didn't know what you were doing. And I mean, that's okay. It's okay. Everything's, you know, it's, it's, it's just the thing you came here to do, have a human experience, but we don't have to cling to all that suffering when we were so young and incapable of dealing with it. Well, and to recognize that I agree with you completely. And the thing that we often forget as we grow up is that it isn't fair. No, you know, nothing's no one, fair. And when children, when adults in children's lives betray them in whatever way that that's done, whether it's, you know, the mother who abandons them, the father who's drunk, a drunk, whatever, violence, it doesn't matter. That, that isn't about the child, even though the child is the one that is the, experiences it experiences the result of the adult's behavior. Yeah. And, but often, almost always, children in some corner of their heart, it's their fault. Yeah. If I had been a better kid, if I had, they would have loved me more. If I had done this, (laughs) they would have loved me more. Get out of my head. (laughs) Uh. And so, as an adult, we can't make the experience go away. Yeah. If you're a victim of sexual abuse, nothing's going to make you not a victim of sexual abuse. Absolutely. So the only thing you can do is find another way to relate to the experience. Otherwise, if you keep revisiting it, yeah. and you keep revisiting the abuse as the victim, then what's happening? Yeah, You're just reinforcing... You're reabusing yourself. Yeah, you're reabusing yourself. That's that's And it's beautiful. such a that's, terrible thing yeah, because yeah, how so do well you put. how do you find that road out yeah. from that? And uh, I don't pretend to know, but I but I really feel that finding that way to reframe the experience is and teach yourself a different story. Yeah. And one of the sad things about this world um, is, um, or it's just, I, I don't know if I want to call it, I mean, it is sad, but the, one of the real things about this world is I have yet to meet a female in my entire life that has not been sexually abused. I, I haven't met one yet. It just seems to be like this human experience is so, such a rough ride. It's such a rough ride for everyone. And, and that's such a common thing now. Um, and probably for all time, probably have always been there that has way. always <coughs> you know? I think even because I love to read all kinds yeah. of things but um, you know as far back as there are social commentaries yeah and I and not to invalidate people like no. I don't I don't say that to invalidate I people it's just a comment on that. the world 
it's an observation that in fact it doesn't minimize the personal experience no, and of that's abuse. that's not what I'm intending. But it is a statement that in fact in human society abuse especially of females, especially of children, yeah. has been going on as long as there has been documented history. Yeah. And um, that doesn't make it okay. And But there's nothing, you know, that's a collective, like a, it's almost like a, a dormant, um, virus in your body, you know, that can come out at any time. Yeah. And um, I don't think our society's doing much to create a nonviolent society. Yeah. And um, I can't say that I don't participate. I went to see Top Gun. I loved it. <laughs> you know, it's like, I loved yeah. Western movies. Yeah. You know, it's like, but somehow it's become even more pervasive. I think I read a thing that said that they figure that now children who watch television and um, social media and all that kind of thing, that by the time they're 18, they've seen hundreds of thousands of acts of violence. Yeah. So I can't believe that that doesn't affect them. No, it know? definitely does. It definitely and does. you're perception of the value of human life and the importance of um, the importance of the integrity of every human being and um, you know I find it interesting because I came from a, you know my generation vengeance and justice and all those righteous things you know mm. they were right up there no wonder westerns were so popular yeah because that is the underlying piece you know and um so whether it's fast and furious or bruce willis or <laughs> the superheroes we have that piece about wanting to make the bad things right you know we're gonna fix them yeah and that you can't let them get away with it. And there's always going to be somebody bigger and stronger who can help you and save you. It just simplifies this complex experience yes, we're having it does. so easily. Those are bad guys. These are good guys. I know. And it's like it's never, and I'm not going to get into it, but it's like why I love Star Wars so much. You know, yes, because absolutely. the bad guys are so convinced that they're bringing order to the galaxy and they're doing the thing that needs to be done the most. Yep. And they're spending every single resource to bring order to the galaxy because it desperately needs it from their perspective. And I said I wasn't going to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I love Star Wars. Yeah, you know. So <clears throat> one of my great epiphanies, because I was raised to be very clear about this is right and this is wrong, and there's no excuse for wrong, yeah. for me personally. So that was a very comforting place to be. Oh, and yeah, it is. It was. Yeah, I was now very you know righteous. Again. Now I know again. Exactly. Until, as an adult, I found myself, and I considered myself a good person, doing something that wasn't good. Mm. And I knew some people who others would label as bad people who did good and kind things. Yep. So now, all of a sudden, my clear line about who was on which side <laughs> and what was black and what was white, it became very challenged. And um, in the process of, of resolving that whole experience for myself, I gained more compassion for myself for being less than perfect. Yeah, that's so And important. I gained more compassion for those who were labeled as having made serious mistakes. Because that's all they are is mistakes. Well, everybody so messes <laughs> up. Everybody messes up. No, well, you all, I mean, sometimes, sometimes I mean, they knew they were messing others, up. They didn't yeah. care. They wanted to do yeah. the bad thing. Yeah. Or the illegal thing or whatever. But that that isn't what divine defines the worth of a person. Yeah. And that, in fact, what is that uh, phrase from the Bible? Um, there but for the grace of God go I. Yeah. 
And so it was kind of interesting because as judgment left my kind of toolbox, it's like, what's left? You know, what do I put in the place of justice? There wasn't anything there. It was a great big hole for righteousness. Anyway. Or Ecclesiastes where he says, the righteous think the wicked will be judged as such, and the wicked think the righteous will be judged as such. But God judges all equally. Yes. You know, and that's only our vanity. It is. Yeah. And it is important to remember as we strive to make sense of this life that we lead. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. You know? (laughs) That's a, that's a great place to wrap it up, I think. We're already well over an hour. Okay. This is so much fun. So let's talk about some of your things before we go, because I want to promote all of the stuff oh. that you do. Okay. And, of course, you have um, two books, and they'll both be... Uh, let me get the camera on me real quick. They'll both be in the links below, descriptions below, uh, Invocation of Mindfulness. Yes. As the one you've been talking about. Uh, and then you also have uh, The Great Mother Speaks. That was the most fun. Uh, they were both wonderful to write, but The Great Mother Speaks was a collaboration with my friend, Claudia Mardell. So we ask ourselves the question, if the earth had a voice, what would she say? That was the premise. That was where we started the book. I like that. And so we thought about, well, okay, what voices would the earth have? So we picked the desert and the mountains and the water and the animals. And there's more. But So each of them have a voice. Then the way Cloudy and I wrote the book is we each, there are two sections to every chapter. And there's no identity as to who wrote which one. (laughs) You mean between you and the co-author? Right. Okay. So we each ask the question, like to the mountains, if you had a voice, what would you say? And we wrote what we heard. So they're not always the same. And then in the back of the book is a list. It was such an interesting experience for me. There's a list of things that you can do as an individual to make a difference. And they're not all big dramatic things. They're little things, most of them. But changes in our habits, little changes, changes in shopping choices that we make. And so for me, one of them was my friend who is a vegetarian said to me, well, I don't eat chicken. Oh, yeah. And I said, well, why not? She said, I don't eat eggs. I said, why not? Yeah. She said, because you know what they do, don't you? And I said, what? She said, they, when, the eggs are, when the chickens are born, they kill all the baby boy chickens. I didn't know that. Yeah. And I didn't believe her. They don't lay eggs. So I looked them up. So in the egg industry, that's what they do. And we won't talk about how. That's not very pleasant. Yeah. But for me, the book was, became an education. So in creating a chapter to educate others, I ended up learning all these things, yeah. which I was excited to put into practice in my own life. And I continue to make modifications um, because I have friends who are equally divergent, going down different paths, exploring different things. And so... Um, it's so fun to have those people in they your are. life. You know, they teach you so many unique things that you never would have thought of. I often liken life, my life, and I'm, it would be true for anyone, it's like a tapestry. Yeah. So what do you want? Do you want a tapestry that only has one color in it? Everybody's <laughs> the same. They all think like me. They look like me. Uh, or, it's so easy to do that. Too. It is, it is. Yeah. So what Never I've noticed is as my tapestry gets bigger, as I get older, it's got a lot more color in it than it used to have. I like it. So I have many more divergent friends. And when I use the word color, I don't just mean like the color of one's skin. No, I'm talking about who they are in the world, yeah. who they are within themselves. The aura they put off and yeah. the love that they share. Well, what they bring to my life experience. And it is much richer for the, my friends, you know. Well, I mean, after all, without Yvonne, I never would have written books, <laughs> done breath work, 
or a million other things. Yeah, and I look forward to having her on the podcast. Oh, soon. I know it's going to be, be a wonderful. lot of fun. She's so much fun, and I think uh, we're going to go have a tea ceremony with her here after this. And uh, I'm looking forward to that. She's very well educated on tea and tea ceremonies. She is. It uh, is a passion for her. That's beautiful. Well, um, yeah, and in addition to that, you have your YouTube channel. Um, and uh, let me pull that up. I can put that on the screen real quick as well. There'll be a link to this as well, Linda Heller at uh, Barada TR, as well as just simply Linda Heller 4802. I'll have a link to both of those oh, okay. uh, in the descriptions below. And uh, I'll also include uh, links to your social media. You have a link tree. Um, so you can look her up on all those. And make sure to go to her, Linda's YouTube channel and give her a like and a subscribe and ring her bell with the oh, um, Mindfulness Mondays Yep, that you do there. And uh, is there uh, anything else you'd like to promote before we get out of here? Oh, um, I am in the process. Uh, Yvonne and I are going to co-author a book in right. this next year. I'm really excited about it. However, the Shush. topic of it is yet to be revealed. Do we I mean, we know what it is, yeah. but we're not revealing it to you. Okay. Yeah. Do we have a title for the book? We do, but we're not sharing Nothing's it. Nothing's being revealed. Because then it would though. tell you. Ooh. However, um, no, I think I'll just leave it at that. I like that. I like that. Well, let's get the heck out of here. It's okay. Been, it's been so much fun sitting with you. I feel like I could just sit here for hours and talk to you I about the Dharma. The same, it's been geez. fantastic. What a treat it's been. Yes, it's and been such a, an honor. Thank yeah, you very much. I was much. just about to say, it's been an honor having you on my podcast. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you for watching To the Fullest with Jason Froberg. I appreciate you so much. Please give us a like. Subscribe, ring the bell, follow us on social media. You can support us on Patreon and PayPal. And um, yeah. yeah, let's get the heck out of here. Okay. Peace. Love ya. We got, we got a thing coming up. Good heavens. We could have gone on forever. Wow. Thank you for watching To the Fullest with Jason Froberg. You can check out more podcasts right here and subscribe by clicking right here.